Sisonke Msimang, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the first question I have to ask is, do you speak globalese? I do speak globalese, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm a little bit too uncomfortable in that language, which is why I think it's important to question myself and think about um, how you sh break out of that comfort zone. I think there are too many people who feel very comfortable in global arenas, uh, and it's not an authentic or real experience for the vast majority of people. I don't speak globalese. So can you, for my benefit, tell me what it is and why you coined the term? So globalese is this language that people who uh, give TED Talks and who um, go to international schools and who travel frequently both for pleasure and for work, it's a language that they speak. It's both a kind of way of approaching life as well as a way of speaking in very jargonistic language that is often very uh, detached from the real life experiences of most people. What's wrong with that? I mean, the globalization itself is a very complex matter and issue. Dumbing it down isn't going to serve anybody. So I'm not arguing that we have dumbed down conversation about globalization, but what I am arguing is that conversations that are grounded don't have to be dumb. And the reason why it's important is because we are sitting in a moment in which Lots of people who reject globalization, who live in really rich places and who have no basis for rejecting globalization are doing that on the basis that they're rejecting diversity. And so when you reject diversity and you have a national base that supports that rejection, then you're really rooted and you are speaking from a very local politics. And then we come along with our TED Talks and our fancy, you know, flights and whatever, and we speak up here and we're not often connecting to people on the ground. And so that's what I'm trying to figure out, how we marry those two. What I find really difficult is where I've grown up, a lot of the people that live around me voted Brexit. Yeah. We now have Boris Johnson as our yeah. prime minister. Yeah. Um, and these kind of issues, I feel like I understand why people do them or yeah. why people support it, yeah. but I don't understand how to articulate myself. Yeah. So I guess I'm trying to understand how yeah. you're trying to also do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's exactly right. The reason why people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are really popular is because they feel like they speak to something really fundamental in people's daily experience. Um, and they speak from a place of fear even though they don't often express themselves in that way. And that fear connects with a lot of the fear that people are feeling, you know, who live in local places. And then on the other hand, all the people who are against people like Donald Trump, who argue that the world should be closer, that our cultures are in any case moving together anyway, and that migration is good. Those people who argue those things often do so in really technical, really boring, really policy language. They speak globalese. And they don't often talk about what it means to live in a particular community and have that view. There's a lot of coded language when we talk uh, about globalization because it's not just the movement of money and, and economics, but globalization means the movement of culture and people. That's right. It's really easy to hide behind that word. Um, and it's really easy to have these other conversations under the guise of the word globalization. So um, Donald Trump can talk about how he rejects tariffs, how, um, you know, how he's worried about the um, American economy. He can talk about trade protectionism. And all of that stuff is globalese. It kind of sounds technical. But underneath what he's doing is that he's really concerned about Mexico. And he's really concerned about China and tariffs. He's not so concerned about Sweden and all the Ikeas that are popping up all over America, right? He's not so concerned about um, all of the Australian backpackers who overstay their visas. And yet the issue with the border with Mexico in Donald Trump's language is that people are um, coming in illegally. So if he's concerned about law and order and legal, then he should be concerned about it for everybody. And so what it does when we talk about it um, in this way is it allows us to speak in code and not get to the point. And so in some ways, I feel like the word globalization can be really distracting. If we get rid of the word globalization and globalism, like what are we left with? We're just left with less ways to, to talk about the problem. No, I think we're left with more important and direct ways to talk about the problem. So then we can call it out for what it is and we can say, um, 
are you concerned about? If you're concerned about Mexico, then let's talk about that. Are you concerned about migration? Let's talk about that. Are you concerned about racism? Let's talk about that. So taking the complicated jargon off doesn't mean that we're taking the issues off the table. Globalization itself, is it a benefit to society or do you think it's just not worth the cost? Globalization can be neutral. What you think about globalization, whether it's good or bad, uh, depends on what your country's experience has been. So back again to the local. So if you live in a rich country, um, often the experience of globalization has been actually pretty good for you in economic terms, right? If we look at the last 30 years, lots of boats have been lifted by cheaper goods, uh, more jobs. Um, you know, there's lots of great benefits of globalization for people who live in rich countries. If you live in a poor country, if you live in the Philippines, if you live in South Africa, where I'm from, often globalization has meant terrible things. It's meant that um, your government has encouraged companies to come and invest, um, often in really low paying jobs, often given them tax holidays and said, be here for 10 years, you don't have to pay taxes. SEZs, free trade zones. Free trade zones, there's so many examples of the kind of horror that globalization has wrought on poor countries. So when I say that it's neutral, what I mean is it really depends on one, where you sit, but also to recognize that um, some of the reasons why terrible things have happened in the name of globalization in poor countries is because of the bad leadership in those poor countries. So I don't want to only blame the West, right? I think that's a, a very big problem that we often get into. And so ultimately my argument is political leadership, no matter where you are, is the thing that will determine whether globalization works for you or whether it doesn't work for you. So should we really be having two conversations here? One about globalization and the way us in the global North experience it and another debate altogether about what it's been like for a Vietnamese farmer or, or, or an Eritrean uh, sort of worker. Is this two conversations we should be having? More, I think it's more than two conversations. So on the one hand, yes, that's two distinct conversations. I think there's a whole set of conversations about what globalization has meant if you're um, a working class person who lives in Detroit and has been, whose manufacturing industry has dried up and has been laid off. Uh, I think that's a very real experience. And the inability to talk about that because people on the other side are shouting you down uh, because you can't get rid of the code, I think is part of the problem. That's why the discussion becomes so polarized. And just saying what we mean, I think goes a long way towards then figuring out solutions. Because ultimately, I think all of us are less interested in talking about issues and we're more interested in solving them. You can't get to the solving part unless you're clear in what the problems are. You've said before, you see political battles are still fought locally, even if they have downstream global implications. The fight that will settle the future of things like climate change are taking place block by block, town by town, city by city, state by state, and country by country. Isn't that just parochial? Are we just trying to par off this problem that the survival of our planet depends on to whether you have local communal gardens or not. That's not going to solve climate change. That's a global problem. That's globalization. If you had asked me this question before two years ago, I would have been on the same side as you. Um, but in the era of Donald Trump, given what we see with the Paris Climate Agreement and the effective pullout of America from that, um, one of the biggest uh, global economies in the world, but also one of the biggest polluters in the world, your agreement is only as powerful as the weakest link. And America right now is a really, really weak link. And so the options that we face at this moment in time are either to regroup and to rethink this question of globalization, which was on a particular trajectory for many years, progressive, Global-minded people thought that we could solve problems on a global scale. And we are confronted with a moment in which that is not the case. So we simply can't fold our arms and say, well, global didn't work. Then we would do nothing. And so we must return to the principles of democracy, 
we must return to notions of citizenship to hold people accountable so that we aren't stagnant. Because my biggest fear is that we will fold our arms because the global seems like it's not working anymore. And who is this we? People of goodwill. <laughs> it sounds huge, but actually, you know, I think, again, even as the situation looks really dire and the political landscape is very, very gloomy, at the same time, we have this upsurge in young people who are taking these issues very seriously, who are not interested in decorum, who are actually having very direct conversations about exactly what the issues are and aren't playing around with niceties and globalese. Uh, in many ways, that's who we is. Um, you have to invest in the places where people are doing stuff. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>